Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for taking the time to come out this evening. I'm Tamara Higgins, president of Sundog Poetry. We appreciate uh, taking time out of your busy, busy schedules because we know how busy we all can be, especially <laughs> during Poetry Month, right? Yeah. <laughs> We have many to thank for making this new book a reality. The very first person who is important to acknowledge is Mary Jane Dickerson. In, in 2015, Mary Jane wholeheartedly agreed to take to the road with me to explore bookstores throughout Vermont through snowstorms, and into late nights, always returning with bags full of books. We were excited about the potential for the lecture series we were planning. Thank you, Mary Jane, for your willingness to shape an idea into a reality. Mary Jane and I were amazed over and over again at the generosity of every Vermont poet we contacted who so willingly agreed to partake in the original lecture series. We thank those poets here this evening, as well as the additional poets who enthusiastically agreed to share their expertise for this collection. I don't believe there's another anthology like this, and I am humbled to be a part of it. <coughs> I'd also like to take this moment to thank the lead editor of this anthology, Neil Shepard. Neil's keen eye, sharp ear, attention to detail, and commitment to quality made this book as perfect as it could be. In addition to these traits of Neil's, he is an absolute pleasure to work with. Thank you, good friend. <laughs> Publishing a book is always hard work, but it is certainly worth it when the design and layout reflect the quality held within. For this, we thank Green Writers Press. And lastly, thank you, Orca Media, for filming this evening's readings which we are so ready for. Please welcome Neil Shepard, who will give a brief introduction to begin this evening's program. I guess we should be filmed with a beer for Poetry Month. So yes, I'm Neil Shepard, and uh, I'm the co-editor of the anthology, uh, along with Tamara Higgins, who is instrumental in so many phases of the project, but most importantly, in keeping uh, our publisher, Green Writers Press, on task uh, in the design, layout, printing, and distribution, without which we would have nothing to celebrate. So, Tom Ron Higgins, thank you so much. And just a few words about uh, Sundog Poetry Center, what it is and what it does for poetry in Vermont. Uh, first, our activist board members are all here this evening. Lucy Higgins, who's back there selling the books, and Judy Arnell, and Mary Jane Dickerson, and Pamela Harrison, both of whom will be reading tonight, um, along with Tamra and, and I. Our mission at uh, Sundog Poetry is to bring poetry to Vermonters, Vermonters of all ages and in every corner of the state We've offered poetry programs for grade schools and high school populations. We've offered writing workshops for adults from young adults to elder hostel. We've offered readings and lecture series for wide ranging populations. And uh, we've created programs in, on poetry and social justice, on poetry, food, and culture, uh, all of which you should feel free to join in. And lastly, uh, we've dedicated ourselves to publishing one book of poetry a year, sometimes uh, a book of poems by an individual poet, and sometimes anthologies such as the one that we're celebrating today, Vermont Poets and Their Craft, and one that will be coming out soon by uh, Stephen Kramer, who's with us tonight, and uh, that's called Turn It Up. Is that it, Stephen? Turn It Up. Music and poetry from Jazz to Hip Hop by way of rock and roll. So that'll be coming out in the fall. And we're excited about each one of these books we publish. Um, so 
Sun Dog is busy, very busy, and it can use all the help it can get. And if you're interested in helping us see Mary Jane or Tamara or me afterwards or during the intermission, and we'd be happy to take your names. Okay. <laughs> So what a pleasure to officially launch Vermont Poets and Their Craft and have most of the contributors here with us today, each ready to read a small sample from their craft essays. To the poets who contributed their time, energy, and wisdom to this project, thanks so much for your commitment to this art form and to spreading the word about the high quality of poetry in Vermont. And to the audience gathered here this evening, thanks so much for attending and supporting Vermont Poetry and Vermont Poets. As you'll see when you purchase a copy of Vermont Poets and Their Craft and read my introductory remarks in it, which I'll paraphrase here, this anthology offers thought-provoking essays on the elements of poetic craft by some of Vermont's leading poets. It's an exciting and invaluable resource, whether you are an accomplished poet or a reader curious about poetry's allure, a student seeking insights into poetic craft, or a teacher seeking ways to impart these. Among this eclectic group of essayists are two Vermont Poets Laureate, as well as many poets with award-winning books and national prizes. One commonality amongst them is their love of Vermont, its readers and writers, its landscapes and values, and their desire to communicate with poetic means, through po poetic means. Their essays here emphasize the importance of poetic craft, the sounds and cadences that make poems' content come alive, the vivid images that create a sensate world in which the poem exists, the metaphorical connections that clarify or augment what readers cannot sometimes access directly, and the shape of the lines and stanzas that provide a visible, almost tangible pattern on which the words are strung. While Vermont Poets and Their Craft is partly a local affair, discussing Vermont poems and poetic concepts that resonate for writers here in the Green Mountains. It also reflects ideas about poetic craft that come down to us from several thousand years ago and several thousand miles away. And so uh, that's my few minutes introducing, and now we're going to hear from the illustrious contributors to the anthology, but first a few housekeeping details. Uh, the contributors' extensive biographical notes are in the back of the anthology. If you want to know more about them, the anthology is a place to find out. And uh, it's on sale for uh, $20, $5 off the, the price, and no shipping and no tax. And we're going to proceed uh, in the, uh, the talks tonight in reverse alphabetical order as poetry is a radical art form in which the last shall be first. And, and so the batting order, um, shall I announce it? Uh, it's Martha Zweig, Baron Wormser, Diana Whitney, Dee Dee Jackson, David Huddle, Jeff Hewitt, Pamela Harrison, Mary Jane Dickerson, Char Deniord, Greg Delante, Stephen Kramer, Nadine Budbill and Lois Eby, who will be reading an excerpt of the essay that David Budbill contributed to the anthology, and last but not least, who is often first, Partridge Boswell. And since Tamara and I have done the introductions, we will not be reading from our essays, and the two other contributors to the anthology who are missing tonight are Sidney Lay and Major Jackson, who, as they say, had other commitments. Um, and so uh, I asked uh, the poets to uh, read a poem and then accompany uh, it with some remarks about the craft, and we'll see if they um, follow my directions. As we know, uh, poets, directing poets is like trying to herd a clouder of cats. So anyway, without further ado, Martha Zweig. backwards. Here we go. Um, my plan was to comment from the essay first and then do the poem and that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> uh, 
I, uh, I think of myself as an odd duck in this company uh, because I don't do plain style. Uh, I don't do narrative except very rarely. And I don't do, from, <coughs> I don't compose from my real life incidents except in heavy disguise. And I try very hard never to do wisdom. <laughs> um, I like to rub words together. Uh, sometimes at random, I'm good with a prompt. I like a prompt. And it often happens for me that I don't even know what the poem is about until it's about two thirds through. And then I say to myself, oh, I never would have thought of that in a million years. You know, it is wonderful what words do with their noises and associations and, and little uh, tricks and twirls. Um, <clears throat> I'm also highly enamored of the uh, uh, Jewish mystical myth of the letters and the letters of Hebrew are living creatures, yes. And so that extends for me into larger language, which I imagine as a really strange critter um, flapping around out there like a pterodactyl. And I am hoping that it will speak to me. Um, yeah. This is much easier than if I had to start with a subject matter. Uh, don't even talk to me about subject matter. Um, also, I find the, the whole wordplay business and the rattle and tumble of wordplay uh, works very well for political poems, at least for me. So this one is called Pledge. It is uh, based on messing around with the words of the Pledge of Allegiance to our flag. The nation's one under God glows in the dark. To its immense satisfaction, cover your heart and allege. Repeat after me, pistol, packermeister, and school kid of in-memories, I'm not gonna stand for it. Units of distaste, privy trough, hog-tied public flag about the chinny, chin-chins, yum. Ruling classic for all, flog a misfit for the edification, prod the glib and glibberty dissidents up to a drop-step gibbet jig. Video, Amber waves goodbye and God speedy too. Boo hoo, you, it's just US of A, another disgruntled grunts, shocked and all shucks, Americanus, cannibalist, dog eat hot, diggity dog, jackal of oil tirades, commo dieties of the exchange, hawk it up, yank, and jingo. And if you want to follow all those puns, you can buy the book and read about them. Uh, thanks so much to uh, Tamara and to Neil for all their hard work on this book. It's a beautiful book. I'm going to... Um, read a bit uh, from my piece in the book and read a poem. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to begin with a quote uh, from, which is the title of my piece, from the Polish poet Adam Zagajewski from his book, uh, Two Cities. Two contradictory elements meet in poetry, ecstasy and irony. The ecstatic element is tied to an unconditional acceptance of the world 
including even what is cruel and absurd. Irony, in contrast, is the artistic representation of thought. Criticism, doubt. Ecstasy is ready to accept the entire world. Irony, following the steps of thought, questions everything, asks tendentious questions, doubts the meaning of poetry and even of itself. Irony knows the world is tragic and sad. That two such vastly different elements shape poetry is astounding and even compromising. No wonder almost no one reads poems. <laughs> At Zagayevsky. Uh, end of quote. The ecstatic element is childlike, praise-giving, erotic, fervent, impulsive, materialist, contemporary, open, and unselfconscious. The ironic element is adult, critical, compromised, wary, thoughtful, abstract, historical, self-protective, and self-conscious. Little wonder that poets are sometimes confused creatures. And little wonder, as Zagayevsky notes, that there are not many takers for the delights poetry purveys. We can say, of course, that most people, if not all people, have these elements floating around within them. We cannot say, however, that most people actively engage them the way that poets do. We cannot say that the everyday world thrives on poems. The everyday world would not be everyday if it did. The unique blend of irony and ecstasy in this or that poem contributes to the startling beauty we hope to find in poems. There is, for instance, poetry's habit of asking in a way that is part childlike ecstasy and part adult irony. What is that? Poetry always hinges on that wondrous, <coughs> naive, yet philosophical question. In that regard, poetry's enemies are knowingness and cleverness, those socialized plagues that will always be with the human race. This mingling of irony and ecstasy is bound to make poetry a radical art, full of a strange mix of the comforting, being is good, and the discomforting, being is the ground of much torment, both physical and mental. Sometimes, to focus on the poetry of the United States, it walks right through the gates of Puritan hell, as in the works of Emily Dickinson, Robert Frost, and Sylvia Plath. Sometimes it offers an alternative vision of how we might approach life, as in Walt Whitman, Wallace Stevens, and William Carlos Williams. For my part, I cannot say that living on that knife's edge has been unnatural for me. This may have something to do with my being Jewish. It may have something to do with my residing for over two decades in the Maine woods without the electrical amenities. It may have something to do with my working in a mill town in Maine for those decades where life was very close to the ground. Disabused wonderment would be a box I could check. Here is a poem. Joy. To scoop up a scrap of feeling that falls from the gusty October sky, a raw little thing like a bare hatchling of fresh blood stain, the air thick with ochre and violet, as if an abstract expressionist had taken hold of a cloud and soaked it till it bled ghost tears, then brayed with crafty giddiness at arts prodigal counterpunch, a bray the cars take up out of impatience, for they must be elsewhere, and soon, and this moment is only a mental tunnel, more failed history, though when a woman turns her head sideways and sees one of those slim trees the city plants, clinging to a few last leaves, as if they were dignity itself. It's hard not to squirm with admiration, lift weary hands off the wheel, and yell to the stooped, goggle-eyed guy on the sidewalk, leaning to catch something. Don't pocket it. Let it grow. The guy looks up, big, incredulous eyes, 
big ears too, and like the wandering Jew, he softly groans. Thank you. Hi, I'm Diana Whitney, and I was so honored to give this lecture. It was at Bartleby's Books in Wilmington, Vermont. It feels like a long time ago. It's called The Dense Fragrance That Rises from the Earth, Nature and Desire in Lyric Poetry, which uh, has been one of my obsessions uh, pretty much since I, I was writing poems in college. So I'm going to read a short section from the essay, and it includes a poem, but it's not my poem, so I guess I'm breaking the set. I mostly focused on um, other, other poets' work. The etymology of desire is from the old French, désiré, drawn from the Latin, the original sense translating to await what the stars will bring. This root likely comes from the phrase desideri, meaning from the stars. And so the word desire originates from beyond, from something outside the human world. In lyric poetry, we can express the experience of longing with more subtlety and more power when we write about nature. Nature poetry has sometimes been maligned as dry, dull, or sexless, perhaps because it's been associated with Mr. Wordsworth rambling the Lake District with journal in hand, writing about snowdrops and daffodils. And here I want to pause and apologize to the Wordsworth fans in the room. Of course, he was brilliant and vital to our tradition, but I don't personally find his work sexy. <laughs> okay, so there is another tradition of nature poetry that is written from the body, and the poems I want to discuss possess this urgency and heat. Eroticism is first and foremost a thirst for otherness, says Mexican poet Octavio Paz, in his book, The Double Flame, Love and Eroticism. Is eroticism the same as desire? Not exactly, but let's assume the two are kindred spirits and that desire is also an energy directed outwards, a movement towards the other. In Jane Kenyon's brief poem, September Garden Party, she captures an erotic moment using a few sensual images drawn from nature. Like many of Kenyon's poems, it is deceptively simple, written with transparent language and clean syntax. September Garden Party. We sit with friends at the round glass table. The talk is clever. Everyone rises to it. Bees come to the spiral pear peeling on your plate. From my lap or your hand, the spice of our morning's privacy comes drifting up. Fall sun passes through the wine. On the outset, nothing much happens at this garden party, but there is abundant movement in the poem, a rising that encompasses the clever talk, the entranced bees, and especially the lover's scent drifting up. The final image of sun passing through wine becomes a moment of transcendence a radiant act of intermingling where light and liquid meet. Kenyon conjures erotic intimacy by transferring the action. The bees and the spiral pear peeling are central to her eroticism. They embody the purely instinctual animal aspect of desire and its irresistible sweetness. We watch the speaker watching the bees. Then we catch a whiff of the pleasure she has experienced the spice of our morning's privacy, which remains hidden under the table, even more alluring because of its secrecy. So I'll, I'll stop there. When, um, when I gave the lecture, I went on to cover some of my other favorite writers, such as the Scottish poet John Burnside, Pablo Neruda uh, from the 100 Love Sonnets, from which the title is taken. Mock Orange uh, by Louise Gluck, and then I concluded with one of my own poems. So thank you. Hi, I'm Dee Dee Jackson. 
Um, my essay was titled, or is titled, Writing Grief, and um, I wanted to read to you um, the poem that brought me to my own ability to write about my own grief, um, which is a poem by Ruth Stone, one of our own here in Vermont. Um, and what I'll do is then I'll read a few comments afterwards about what I feel about the poem um, and what I think is remarkable, remarkable about that. Winter. The 10 o'clock train to New York. Coaches like loaves of bread powdered with snow. Steam wheezes between the couplings. Stripped to plywood, the station's cement standing room imitates a Russian novel. It is now that I remember you. Your profile becomes the carved handle of a letter knife. Your heavy-lidded eyes slip under the seal of my widowhood. It is another raw winter. Stray cats are suffering. Starlings crowd the edges of chimneys. It is a drab misery that urges me to remember you. I think about the subjugation of women and horses, the brutal exposure, weather that forces, that strips. In our time, we met in ornate stations, arching up with 19th century optimism. I remember you running beside the train, waving goodbye. I can produce a facsimile of you standing behind a column of polished oak to surprise me. Am I going toward you or away from you on the train? Discarded junk of other minds is strewn beside the tracks. Mounds of rusting wire, grotesque pop art of dead motors, senile warehouses. The train passes a station. Fresh people standing on the platform, their faces expecting something. I feel their entire histories ravish me. So my students know that I admit openly and often that I have two favorite craft devices. One is figurative language, uh, particularly a metaphor and simile, and then the other sound devices. And so in this poem, Ruth Stone um, imagines for herself this immediate world, and it gives her grief a metaphor. She, she reveals her grief metaphorically. And then also the sounds convey the difficulty of surviving suicide loss. And so I thought I would just read two sections in which I address those. While Ruth Stone's poem, Winter, is important in content, is equally valuable in its craft, she opens the poem with a simile, comparing the snow-speckled coaches of a train to loaves of bread. In the next few lines, she lengthens the starkness of her compelling opening image of winter by employing assonance and consonance. The soft O of coaches, loaves, powdered and snow, pull out the cold and lonely landscape of the scene. She personifies the steam of the train as it wheezes between the couplings and carries those images along in the following lines with the consonant of the S, the hiss of the S. Stripped to ply with a station cement standing room imitates a Russian novel. By using multiple elements of figurative language, all at once, Stone can link and augment images. One image can fall into another, as it does here with the train in the cold, the sound of the train, and finally, the train station itself. As the poem continues, Stone piles metaphor on top of metaphor. The train station becomes a Russian novel. The letter knife becomes the profile of her dead husband. The dilapidated warehouses are senile mines, and the junk along the track is nothing more than grotesque pop art. The feeling of movement on a train, the feeling of a lack of control in both physical movement and psychological movement are all evident here in, on, in her onslaught of images and metaphors. As readers, we can experience the overwhelming sensation of pain of this particular memory and lack of control as the memory emerges. 
the reality of what she sees and experiences in real time contrasts greatly with the images from her memory. Language like raw, suffering, drab, brutal, discarded, rusting, grotesque, and senile. Considerably contradict words like optimism, optimism, sorry, polished oak and fresh reaffirming the sorrow and the difficulty of her current condition and the longing for her previous life with her husband, Walter. Thank you. It's my opinion that if you can write any kind of a poem, it's lucky. As long as you can call it a poem, it's lucky. It's a good poem. You're really lucky. So what I'm going to read is the end of my essay, and it's going to be about a poem of mine that I feel extremely lucky to have written. And there are a couple of things about it that uh, are part of the luck, one of which is that I have written a lot of sonnets and a lot of villanelles. So I am very familiar with those, and I tinker with them. I change them. I mess around with them. So, But I know how to do that. And the other thing is that when I wrote this poem, I was teaching at Holland's University and living by myself and was pretty lonely except when Lindsay would come down and visit. But I had a two mile walk that I did twice a day that involved walking up a hill to a graveyard and through a graveyard and then across a ridge and then down a hill and then alongside a stream for a while and then up a hill and then by a horse pasture where sometimes the horses came out and talked to me before I got to my house. So that's part of it. Those are two parts of the luck. This is called Roanoke Pastoral. Cardinal Goldfinch, Titmouse, Turkey Buzzard, dear companions of my afternoons, above this field high clouds dream of blizzards to snow me in till spring ends my solitude. Sobers my binge now, nature my saloon, wren, morning dove, house finch, turkey buzzard. For your entertainment, I sing the words of old 50 songs, use baby talk, croon as I walk the field beneath great blizzard, dreaming clouds. You gaudy pretties, sweet birds of my senior years, my leaders, my soon. Catbirds flit through cedars in the graveyard. Turkey buzzards swirl their patterns overhead. Across the mountainside, sunlight bows a tune, rising to blue eternity, but heard by the heron fishing the creek. Wizard of stillness, creature designed by the moon. Bluebird jay, chipping sparrow, turkey buzzard, clouds and field. I dream this life, walk this world. Every serious poet has a mental library of poems that help him or her make new poems. This help is usually subconscious, but the example, example of a specific poem can also consciously assist in the composition of a new poem. In Roanoke Pastorel, some readers can probably see and hear the influence of E. E. Cummings as anyone lived in a pretty how town, and Theodore Retke's The Waking. The Cummings poem is not a villanelle, but in its length and its use of repetition, the composition functions and sounds like a villanelle. In the variations of repeated lines, it was of particular use to me in writing Roanoke Pastoral. The Retke poem, which is a moderately strict villanelle, helped me find the tone I needed for my exceedingly loose version of the form. I would describe that tone as song-like and ecstatically surrealist. If I'm correct in thinking that Roanoke Pastorel is my highest accomplishment as a poet, I also have to acknowledge it may also be the piece in which I received the most help from other poems and poets in my realizing the composition. An incorrect notion I held for at least my first dozen years of trying to write serious poems and stories was that the writer works alone and is solely responsible for his or her artistic achievement. It is certainly true, and we readers experience this aspect of literary accomplishment every time we read an excellent piece of writing, that the author's individual sensibility is a dominant quality of the thing he or she makes seemingly 
out of nothing. Now in my 75th year of life and my 50th year of writing publishable work, I see that the amount of help we receive in making literary art is astonishing. Not only do we have the examples and the tools of our art handed down to us, we also have the great world constantly feeding our need for experience, mystery, beauty, suffering, courage, etc. And we have those who come before us, the thousands of them, whose writing we have encountered in our lives, whose work inspires us, yes, but that writing also has taught us how to do the work we want to do ourselves. And many of us have our families and friends who have instilled in us an appreciation of literature and the attempt to make literary art. When I sit down to read, I have my mother's voice in my memory of her reading The Wind in the Willows and dozens of other children's books in my, to my brothers and me when I was a child. I have a memory of Arne Weingart reading his Snake Pit poem in James Tate's writing workshop at Columbia. And I clearly remember John Engels reading for the first time his Vivaldi in early fall in John Dewey Lounge in the Old Mill Building at the university. Yes, we do it by ourselves, but also, yes, we do it with the enormous and utterly necessary and generous assistance from a thousand different sources. We are both alone and astoundingly assisted in our attempts to bring poems into the world. We need both the at it and we hum. We need both the solitude and the help in our effort to testify to what it means to be human and to articulate such revelations as we are capable of discovering and inventing. Thank you. The morning I started the final um, draft of my essay, Grounding the Moment, Winter's Existential Proof, um, on top of neighboring New Hampshire's Mount Washington, 100 mile per hour winds created a wind chill of minus 94 degrees Fahrenheit, tying that day for the second coldest place in the world. Seasonal extremities have always presented irresistible invitations to poets. For generations, New Englanders have mined winter's sensory and thematic riches to craft poems verging on the existential. In his essay, The Poet, Ralph Waldo Emerson writes, nature offers all her creatures as a picture language. The poet attaches things to nature and to the whole. He does not stop at facts, but employs them as signs. The highest minds of the world have never ceased to explore the double meaning of every sensuous fact. Magical thinking. Magical thinking springs from an imagination that works by metaphor. The thisness of this, set against the thatness, the thatness of that, joined in one inspired likeness which appears, if it appears, like the bouquet from a magician's patently empty hat. Look inside, close as you will, and still you'll wonder where those posies came from. Once I lived deep in the country and drove an old car that had no heater through a blizzard home. By the time I got there, my hands were so frozen, I could not work the key. Though why I'd locked the door in those uncommon parts, I couldn't say. Light and belonging, all the human riches of home, waited for my entry from the other side. Behind me, snow mounted slowly over the shoulder of my little car, obliterated what was left of the frozen road. I bent to the lock, almost weeping, pressing all the weight of my body on the indifference of the door, holding my offering in both hands then, like a prayer. The poem's formal organization works by giving a, a definition of metaphor in the first stanza, then an experiential exemplum in the second for the reader to think on. I want to call your attention to three lines in the second stanza where sound values take on a meaningful weight of implication. 
for what I've called in the title of this lecture, Winter's Existential Proof. Behind me, snow mounted slowly over the shoulder of my little car, obliterated what was left of the frozen road. What is the recurrent sound in those lines? Oh, oh, oh. And what is the sound of woe? A keening oh, 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 signaled by the repeated O oh sounds in snow, slowly, over, shoulder, obliterated and frozen road. The place of, of despair in this poem arrives when the speaker suddenly realizes the impending presence of winter's mortal danger. Happily, though the narrated plot does not say whether the speaker's offering her prayer, both figures drawn from the realm of religious practice, is answered. Readers realize after the poem's end that those palms together must have done their trick because the speaker has lived to tell the tale. Thank you. Maybe a 10 or 15 minute break, no one can leave. And, and then, uh, we'll, we will uh, see you for the second half of the really big show. Yeah. Okay. Uh, additional events, Sundog events this coming week, we have one tomorrow in Underhill, and that's a poetry reading by Mary Jane Dickerson's 17th annual April Poetry Workshop <coughs> participants. So if you are able to get to the Underhill area at the Deborah Rawson Library, please join us for that. It's always a wonderful reading. The second event this week is our third and final AMP night. AMP me, uh, stands for Art, Music, and Poetry. And that's a Lamoille County series that we do in conjunction with River Arts of Morrisville. This event will be Thursday at the Farm Store on Main Street in Jeffersonville. Our artist is a fiber artist, Karen Henderson of Montpelier. The musicians are a, a band um, made up of Mount Mansfield High School students called Lemonade Lady. Uh, they play jazz and, uh, Ellen, where are you? Jazz and- uh, I'm sorry, what? Lemonade Lady. Oh, Lemonade Lady. They do funk, jazz, with a little bit of rock influence. So it'll be a great, uh, great musical night. And then our poet, again, is Stephen Kramer here in the audience, who will be reading tonight, too. So that's Thursday, Jeffersonville, 6 to 8 p.m. And then, in addition to those events, um, we have the kind of the four big events coming up for the rest of the year for four of the next five five or so um, in this card so please take the card with you to keep with to keep with you so we are planning our second justice and poetry for all which will take place in the north end of Burlington June 21st and our focus will be new Americans and uh, the poetry of new Americans and immigrants and then we have two things the mouth loves poetry and food, of course. And that's a retreat with Neil Shepard and Kate Riley in September. And then the um, anthology of Stephen Kramer's coming out in the fall. And our sixth annual retreat at Fielder Farm has just opened up its registration. So without further ado, no, delay, <laughs> we are going on to Mary Jane Dickerson. First, I would like to say, I did not know Tamara was going to say what she did at the, in her introduction. But I want to say that Tamara and I wrote our, she, I wrote the first half, she wrote the second half. If you can write with somebody in complete harmony and agreement, that's true love and friendship. I could not ask for a better person to work with. It's like having another daughter. <laughs> and I'm open to having daughters. <laughs> Thank you, Tamara. I combined 
a little new reflection with some quotations from uh, the essay, the part of the essay that I wrote. And then, uh, and then I will end with the poem that came, one of the poems that came out of that, a poem that I wrote. But I had considered many of the wonderful poems that by American poets as they have drawn on history to develop and write their wonderful, wonderful poems. Hardly a week goes by that I don't hear the question, where are you from? <laughs> Though I usually reply something about my nearly 53 years of living in Vermont, not having erased the suspicion that I'm from away, the question has, through the years, become ever more urgent as I turn more and more to what I recognize as the central fact of my existence, beyond the family I had been born into and the one I helped to create, was growing up in a racially segregated society, the American South, in a world shaped by the circumstances of segregation. It is this difficult knowledge that both my personal history and that of my region and nation have compelled me to address. First to read and study on my own, and then to teach that rich body of American literature written by African Americans, and now to wrestle with and attempt to express in poems what I have been both a part of and a witness to. Toward the poetics of the past, attempts to examine how America's poets have grapple, grappled with a way of knowing that shows us how lives can be created out of that hard-won knowledge. I regard the poem long hot summers as only one of many to come that must examine a painful history all of us are continuing to share and to ponder because our very lives as citizens of a democracy demand that we do so. Long Hot Summers. In August of 1955, at 17, no more on my mind than going away to college in September. I worked sometimes in my father's store after long mornings under the tobacco shed where mounting heat beat down to ripple in waves across the tin roof. At the store's lunch counter, I assembled hot dogs by the dozens at two for a quarter, stacked moon pies, and pulled cold RCs from the cooler. Greeting each customer by name, Charlie Littlejohn, Andrew Kelly, his sisters, Pinky and Janie, Thelma Williams and Earl Crutchfield. I took worn dollar bills from hands, black hands and white, my hands and theirs, calloused with sticky traces of tar from a morning spent working together, handling tobacco to cure slowly in tall tobacco barns. When I placed change, silver and copper, onto their outstretched hands, excuse me, palms, those coins cool against the lingering heat from our skin. Was it during one of those moments while I, a white store owner's daughter, was making change for black and white 
farm laborers, exchanging the day-to-day -day news of our small town world. Was it then that in Money, Mississippi, 14-year-old Emmett Till might have whistled at, said something to the white store owner's wife, sounds still in dispute, words perhaps never uttered at all, what we'll never know from lips forever sealed, only hours later in the brutal violation of that other teenager's still growing body? Was that the summer the KKK left a stack of printed brochures on the store counter? Paper my father set afire on the cement pavement separating the store from the gasoline pumps? Did I recall those summer days in my own small North Carolina life, small town North Carolina life, when in 1956, I returned to school after another long hot summer of working in tobacco and clerking at the store to find my North Carolina women's college had integrated itself by placing its first two young black women in isolation. Just the two of them living together on a single dormitory floor, separated from all the others in their <coughs> first year class. Just last summer, nearly 60 years later, I returned to another North Carolina August of humid, heat-filled days, with slow hours passing through heavy, moisture-laden air to join my sister as we finished clearing out our mother's house, the repository of 75 years of her adult life. What began as sorting into piles of what to save and what to load onto my son's pickup, soon turned into an excavation as we unearthed artifacts of a life we could only ever partially know or understand. Fragments of writing in her hand about an unnamed person she had never been able to forgive. This in notes while reading C.S. Lewis on prayer. A facsimile of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address folded with care to enclose a KKK broadside dated 1983. As if one document might obliterate or cancel out the other. Both documents yellowed and brittle with age. Messages, indictments, acknowledgments, the yearning to understand and to be forgiven for the sins crossing and burdening our generations into yet another August day, marking the passing of a long hot summer in yet another century. In Citizen, an American lyric, poet Claudia Rankin writes that memory is a tough place. It's wonderful to be here, to be a part of this uh, incredibly rich community in Vermont. Just living in Vermont for the last uh, almost 30 years, I realized it's um, perhaps one of the rarest places in the country for all the great poets here. And it's been enormously humbling and en enriching experience. But I realized, as Mary Jane was 
reading and speaking that so many poets have migrated here, especially from the South. That's uh, interesting. Helen Voigt, uh, who grew up about 30 miles away from me, David Huddle. Um, um, I, I'm from Lynchburg, Virginia. Ruth Stone is from Roanoke, Virginia. Uh, just, just curious. I just thought of that. It was Mary Jane's um, reading. I'm going to um, read a little bit from my essay on Robert Frost. Uh, and um, uh, upon, uh, at the end of my, um, my essay, as I've, as I've been reading, as I've read Frost over the years, I finally realized that, um, and I don't know if um, anyone else has noticed this. I'm sure they have, but maybe not written about it. My, my essay is, is on suspense, suspension, and the sublime in Robert Frost. I realized that he loves to suspend his characters in trees, or like, you know, uh, or at the top of a sta the stairs, as he does in Home Burial, or. Um, and a birch tree, you know, they, uh, and he just, he just loved that in between of the firmament and, and earth. Um, uh, so I'll read a little bit from this essay, which uh, I just, uh, the title of which I just quoted to you. Um, and I'll, I'll start with just a little anecdote. I think many of you know this. On his 85th birthday, uh, Lionel Trilling at the Waldorf Astoria commented, I think of Robert Frost as a terrifying poet. Call him, um, call him, if it makes things any easier, a tragic poet. But it might be useful every now and then to come out from under the shelter of that literary word, the universe, that he conceives is a terrifying universe. Frost um, comment or replied uh, to this, uh, to Trilling uh, from Ripton. Mm -hmm. He said, you made my birthday party a surprise party. You know, it really wasn't a surprise party because everybody up to that um, point had thought of uh, Frost as, as kind of um, a um, just a quaint poet in many ways. You know, he'd won many Pulitzers, but uh, they hadn't really appreciated the terror in his poetry yet. He said, "I should like nothing better than to do a thing like that myself, to depart from the Rotarian norm in a Rotarian situation." And then uh, he concludes his comment. I don't mind being made controversial. No sweeter music can come to my ears than the clash of arms over my dead body when I'm down. <laughs> uh, so I, I took a look at four poems. I took a look at the poem uh, Mowing, um, um, Birches After Apple Picking, and um, a Home Burial, as I think I mentioned. Um, so I'm just going to read the conclusion because this, this would be too long to read any of these, uh, these critiques of those poems. Thrilling and chilling are the two words that describe Frost's most sublime poems, such as the four I've discussed here. Frost, perhaps more than any other American poet, just, uh, mythologized a landscape that continues to be known simply as Frost Country, a landscape that continues to be known simply as Frost Country, I'm sorry. Um, on which he wrote his recurrent obsessions, to borrow a phrase from Simon Schama, or as Frost called them, his quarrels. These now classic quarrels have made, it, have made it close to impossible for any poet to follow Frost in these parts without echoing his work, if even in the slightest reference to a tree or a wall or a hillside, which is why I think the Vermont legislature waited 26 years before appointing the next Vermont state poet the deserving Galway Canal in 1989. Despite several shocking waves of the new that have transpired since Frost's death in 1963, Frost's postmodernism, from, pro from postmodernism to the recent welcome explosion of multicultural voices, readers continue to hang with Frost in his native trees, woods, and roads where they still feel utterly haunted by his narratives, monologues, and dramas. Frost's non-readers of poetry uh, Frost harrows his readers beyond horror with terrors that compel even non-readers of poetry to return again and again for more than just the mere odd pleasure of being frightened, but to discover vicariously that their lives, our lives, are extraordinary, fragile, difficult, painful, bittersweet, contradictory, ecstatic, and grievous. 
Not that we didn't know these things already, but not in the terrifying way that Frost conveys in his best poems. By conveying the felt presence of human experience in physical interactions with the world, Frost divines passage to his readers' psyches through their bodies first, and then their minds and hearts. We feel the abstractions he quarrels with in our bones, whether it's the factual dream of labor or the limits of human consciousness or the affirmation of earth is the right place for love or the inconsolable reality of grief. Frost's language finds us, enchants us, suspends us, then leaves us captured in our own willful restraints. Uh, so I was trying to think of a poem in which I was terrified by something, and I thought of this poem called Goshawk. I was walking through Green Mountain Orchard down near Putney when a goshawk or a northern hawk um, um, attacked me. I was too close to its nest and pulled huge clumps out of my hair. And <laughs> reminded me kind of who, who I was. Um, and. Um, where I was. So uh, I wrote this little poem called Goshawk. How many times have I told this story? There I was ambling along in search of dessert inside the orchard when a goshawk dove on me with outstretched talons. There I was all dressed in cotton in the cool of evening, inspecting the trees for infestation when a goshawk harrowed me. There I was, pinned to the ground like a reprobate with my liver exposed as a fresh hors d'oeuvre on, on a dusty plate, when a goshawk circled me in figure eights. There I was, crawling away behind the trees where the apples hung like brains, and nothing I said reminded this bird of who I was. Thank you. Thank you for including me. Um, and um, I, most people know me here. But um, I'm living in Vermont no longer than I lived in Ireland. And I laugh now and I say, which half of me is the Irish part? Or the lesser half? <laughs> um, so. And when I was asked, to, to write this, I just stuck to form. Um, for me, um, um, traditional forms, open form, and I, I prefer the term open form than free verse, because I don't think anything is free in language, down to the letter. Uh, I always thought that was a wrong term. Um, excuse me, Robert Frost and so forth, the great saying of, uh, what is it, free verse is like playing tennis with the net down. Um, but, and also the mixture of them. So I'm just going to read two little pieces. Um, one on um, the mixture of form. I'm going to, from the book itself. Um, I couldn't use the whole poem because of, um, I, I talked about at the start, uh, we real cool, but you all probably know this poem, surely. Um, I've also forgot my glasses as well, so here we go. The mixture of form. Not all forms are written in either open or traditional form. Uh, many poets in recent times use elements of open and traditional forms in a single poem when it suits what they have to say. A, a great example of this is We Real Cool. Um, <laughs> It is worth it to hear a recording of the poet Gwendolyn Brooks uh, reading her poem. One of her main subjects is the lives of African Americans in the US, especially in the poorer areas, and specifically in Chicago. Normally, in a poem, the rhyme words are placed at the end of each line. In this poem, the last word of each line is we, uh, with the one syllable rhyme word coming just before it. 
except for the very last line of the poem where there is no we. Here are the traditional rhyme words of this four couplet short lined poem. Cool school, late straight, sin, gin, ju, ju, soon. You know it, like I mean, but we real cool, we left school, we lurk late, we strike straight, we sing sin, we thin gin, we jazz tune, is the way she says it, we die so. Um, a reader expects each line to end with these rhymes. Instead, the we comes directly after each of these rhymes and at the end of each line. The, this breaks the expected traditional form and corresponds with the pool players. Since society doesn't give them a, a decent chance, then the pool players rebel or react against tradition. That there is no we after soon, sim at the end, implies that the tradition beats these African American youths, kills them. The we also has an encounter equality reminiscent of African American slaves chanting as they worked. You could say that the we at the end of each line and directly following the different full rhymes are rhymes in themselves and that the pool players are in rhyme with society and that they are connecting with it the only way they can. But for me, the repetition of the we is too much of a rebelling chant, a chant that wants to undo or break the normal traditional rhyming scheme and tradition itself. Does anybody get glasses they can give me a loan of? Sorry. I mean, are they reading glasses? Yeah. Are they very strong? Yeah. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> I can see the page. Sorry, excuse me. I should have done that before that. Um, God, getting old. I can't believe I'm 60. That kind of thing, you know what I mean? And now the short piece, it goes back to... I, I start with the traditional form in the book, in the essay, and go on to open form and then finish up with the mixture of form, which you just heard one of the examples of it there. Um, but here is a, a poem called The Earthworm. Uh, though not a Petrarchian or Shakespearean sonnet, it's one of my own poems, so I'll make it clear at the moment so that you're not trying to figure out who wrote this poem. Excuse me. It wasn't Robert Frost, as you probably will know, but so excuse me for using one of my own poems. It, it kind of embarrasses me, but it was their way out of uh, copyright. The Earthworm. Though not a Petrarchan or Shakespearean sonnet, is a sonnet nonetheless. I chose this particular form as I thought it right for what I had to say. Uh, the first 12 lines are in Terza Rima, the famous rhyme of Dante's Divine Comedy. This poem is from a sequence of similar sonnets about the flora and fauna uh, that today thrive, that are in trouble, and that are extinct. A kind of heaven purgatory in hell. Uh, the book is coming out next year, it's called No More Time. Um, Thus the terzarima. Uh, with regard to the couplet at the end, since the subject of the early sonnet was love, then they are also love poems to the natural world. In the case of this particular sonnet, since this worm works underground, then the form is also appropriate. Uh, and then, little thing at the start. To reproduce, they must face each other upside down, worms, um, in the epigraph to the earthworm. And I'm just going to read a sonnet now. It's kind of terzarima with the couplet at the end. And I, I will say, for me, uh, I'm not interested in writing in open form and traditional form and mixture form. I'm only interested in writing in what's appropriate to what you want to say. And the form is never separate from what you have to say, in my case, at least. 
I also don't agree with different groups of writers in the same way as I remember coming to America first and a, a colleague from St. Michael's, not John Engels, by the way, who was great to me and lovely. Um, I had rhymed something. No, I don't always rhyme. Sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. Sometimes it's open for said, you rhyme. That's old fashioned. You should be writing. Do you understand me? And for me, it never, it, the form, it's all forced in one level. And it's all to do with, also I think that in, in many ways, modern life in the 20th century, we've gone willy-nilly into open form and breaking tradition. And now we have what we have, I'm not a, by the way, I'm not a conservative, but now we have a disconnection from the past and the environment and everything is connected, including poetry and the traditional world. But anyway, the earthworm. What a minor. Sorry for that, um, what do you call it? Um, you know what I mean. The earthworm. What a minor. Pistoning in slow motion through the underworld of the earth. Engineering vents, channels, water flow. Converting death and death. Day in, night out. Each eyeless body digesting the soil nursing birth. Cut in two, they double, breed via marley skin, a must for farm and garden, alfalfa, spuds, spinach, carrots, cabbage, barley, wasibi, wheat, gourds, rutabaga, papaya, I'm saying wrong, endive, you name it. Build them a shrine. May these lowly laborers of Gaia multiply, flourish, never decline, stick with warm love. Position 69. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey. Thank you, Greg Delante. Usually when I come up after another writer, I have to pull the microphone way down. <laughs> so we are kindred spirits in terms of uh, height, and I appreciate that. So, Also, thank you, Neil. Thank you, Tamara, for putting this together. Uh, great night, uh, beautiful anthology. So um, I'm just so pleased to be involved with, uh, with this project. So once when uh, Robert Frost was asked what poetry was, he said, poetry is the sort of thing that poets write. <laughs> now, I know that he's been asked, you know, he'd been asked this dozens and dozens of times, and he gave some great answers over the course of his life, but at some point, uh, it becomes a ridiculous question. I'm sure that the interviewer was thinking something like, thank you very much, asshole, for, uh, for that answer. Now, don't stone me because I know we're in Vermont here, but uh, um, not a great answer. The definition that you're most likely to get for poetry if you um, have assigned a book of um, a textbook for writing class is the best words in the best order. That's Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Um, that's in like every textbook you could possibly find. Um, but that feels to me just so dry. Uh, that definition to me is like eating sand. You know, it, it doesn't really approach what poetry can be. Um, my favorite definition that I've come across is uh, um, Carl Sandburg. He says that uh, poetry is the synthesis of hyacinths and biscuits, <laughs> which is a phenomenal definition there, you know, and I think that definition definitely, um, it deserves more playtime in the world of poetry here, you know. Um, obviously, we're bringing together two very unlike things. Hyacinths, uh, natural production, and biscuits, uh, human production. Um, but for me, it's mostly about the sound. Um, and I think that a definition that would be matched for meaning would be um, poetry is the union of roses and cookies, <laughs> which is a terrible definition for poetry, <laughs> right? Um, and it's severely unmemorable. Um, but Sandberg's definition implies that so much of it has to do with the sound of what we're creating here. It takes pleasure, poetry takes pleasure in the sounds uh, that it produces. 
Um, so the synthesis of hyacinths and biscuits, that's a great definition. Um, so my favorite poems relish in the sounds that they create as much as in their meanings. Um, a great example, which is in this book, is uh, Michael Stillman's poem, uh, In Memoriam, John Coltrane. Uh, it's nine lines long, let me read it to you. In Memoriam, John Coltrane. Listen to the coal rolling, rolling through the cold, steady rain, wheel on wheel. Listen to the turning of the wheels this night, black as coal dust, steel on steel. Listen to these cars carry coal. Listen to the coal train roll. So this poem has definitely, I mean, and obviously been produced with the sound in mind. Um, the assonance of the long O's, um, the long E's, and uh, particularly the O's. You know, vowels have pitches, right? Um, and the E's and the I's are up here in the, the higher registers, but the O's and the O's are, uh, are much lower. Um, it makes sense because a train is heavy. Uh, John, John Coltrane's sound is heavy, um, and so the words should be heavy, right? Um, so listen to the coal rolling, rolling through the cold, steady rain. Those low O sounds get at the feeling of, uh, of the music there. So in any case, this poem is one of the most euphonic poems I think I've ever read. Um, I honestly, I would love to know the number of times that I've read this thing out loud. It is in the high, high hundreds, if not thousands at this point. It's ridiculous. Um, but I love how Stillman gets at the um, feel of Coltrane without any reference to the music and without any reference to you know, biography or anything like that. It's just through the sounds of the words themselves. Um, but because it's in, the, the poem is miraculous actually, it's in three haikus, uh, three haiku back to back. Um, and so it somewhat mimics jazz, uh, in, in a way anyway, because it's an Im improvisation of sorts within a set form. Um, and so um, that's another thing that uh, really draws me to it. So Stillman just nails the art of alliteration here, which can be overdone at times. There are some poems, uh, you know, that, that you read where it's just, there's too much of it, you know? Um, and for me, it's really about the right interplay between uh, repetition and variation in sounds. Um, so I think about it in terms of life, not just poetry, right? Too much variation in life sucks, right? You get to have one raspberry your entire life. That's too much variation. You get to have one kiss your entire life. That's too much variation, right? Um, on the other hand, too much repetition, uh, too much repetition also kind of sucks, right? You're only allowed to eat raspberries. That's great for the first hour, right? You're only allowed to kiss. Okay, again, great for the first hour. Then we're ready to move on to something else, right? Like uh, um, we want to um, um, have some sort of variation. Um, so <laughs> in his poem, Stillman, I think, approaches somewhere uh, um, close, you know, approaches something very close to that satisfying middle ground. Um, and I also like how he uh, compares two very unlike objects. He compares something untouchable, like music, uh, to something that's totally physical, a train. Um, so the synthesis of hyacinths and biscuits, uh, indeed, absolutely. I think I could read Michael Stillman's poem pretty much all day long without needing a whole lot more to happen and be pretty happy. Um, that would make a pretty satisfying day for me. Um, so I'm just gonna end by reading this thing again. Uh, it's so satisfying. In Memoriam, John Coltrane. Listen to the coal rolling, rolling through the cold, steady rain, wheel on wheel. Listen to the turning of these wheels, this night black as coal dust, steel on steel. Listen to these cars carry coal. Listen to the coal train roll. Thanks.
Hello, I am Lois Eby, and I'm here tonight with our daughter, Nadine Budville. Um, we're very honored and humbled to be asked to come and read from David's essay in the book. And we want to thank Neil and Tamara for including us in this event. Uh, we're going to read from David's essay entitled Poetry, Special or Ordinary. And I will read a section and a couple of poems, and Nadine will read a section and a couple of poems. We've tried to um, let David speak for himself. Poetry offers nuggets, kernels, little knots of intense imagery, a vivid moment of clarity about an instant in this world, little lyrics that accumulate into a narrative either consciously telling a story or unconsciously revealing a life. In the best cases, this is not the egomaniacal self-exposure too many poets stick our faces in, but rather something more in the ancient Chinese style, where the poet sees himself, herself, as so much like everyone else, so common, ordinary, so in touch with his species' feelings, that what they see, hear, and feel has got to be what others see, hear, and feel also. Po Chui, an 8th century poet from China, for one example, was so concerned about being clear that he tried his poems out on his illiterate cook, and if she couldn't understand them, he rewrote them so that his cook could understand them. Every writer needs to decide whether he, is, whether he or she wants to be striking and new what a National Endowment for the Arts grant reader called the quirky, odd power of poetry, or whether he or she wants to do what Grace Paley said, we want to be understood. Or as I say in my own poem, advice to myself, never be deliberately obscure. Life is difficult enough. <laughs> Don't add to the confusion. <laughs> and here's another illustration of what I'm talking about from my own work. This poem is titled, All of Us. Out of the undifferentiated Tao come the 10,000 things, the bug in the bird's mouth, the bird in the tree, the tree outside the window, the window beyond the chair, the chair in the room, the man in the chair, who has just risen from the chair and walked across the room to look out the window at the bird in the tree with the bug in its mouth. See how all of us, at our own and different speeds, return to the Tao. Oh, let us all sing praises now for all of us, so briefly here. Poem should be the way Olaf Haga said Bertolt Brecht's verse was, quote, handy to step into. It stood on the doorstep like a pair of wooden clogs, end quote. Open the poet's door, put on those wooden clogs, step into his house, come in, make tea, sit down, open the book, enter his life. I'm a writer, but I've al always been somewhat embarrassed about being a writer, an artist. I don't like the elite and elitist air that so often casts itself over artists and the arts. It is obvious that many people involve themselves with the arts in order to distinguish themselves from the common people out of which I come and with whom I still fiercely identify. I'm interested in the invisible people, the ordinary and downtrodden, the put upon and forgotten. I hate pretense. I want to make art that the common people can understand, use, find meaningful and enjoy. All of this may explain why I firmly believe that poetry is ordinary and is for ordinary people and why my writing is so plain and simple and easy to understand. Here's how I put it once in a poem. Taoist poet. Always everything plain and simple. No fancy words, no allusions, no metaphors, no quirky phases, phrases. No allegories, no analogies, no symbols, no anything standing for something else, no analysis, no conclusions, no grand anything, just the common and the ordinary spoken in a common and ordinary way, 
just this, then that, then the other. Or, to put it another way, on the road to Buddhahood, ever plainer, ever simpler, ever more ordinary. My goal is to become a simpleton. And from what everybody tells me, I am making real good progress. <laughs> Thank you. What a thrill to be part of this choir of very unique soloists. So my deep thanks to Neil and to Tamara for uh, bringing this beauty of a book to life. Um, reading and listening to its many voices today, I feel as if I've been utterly and brilliantly schooled without once having to set foot on the school grounds. It's a beautiful thing for, uh, for poets. I think it's something that you allude to, Neil, in your, when you talk about the kitchen sink school of poetry. Uh, in keeping with the spirit of this uh, reverse alphabetical order, I'll read an excerpt from the end of my essay, Yes, But Could Homer Carry a Tune? For as Eliot says in East Coker, in my end is my beginning. He also says, in my beginning is my end, but we'll ignore that. Um, so it, it, may, it, it may be the end, but it's, uh, it's every bit as inconclusive as the rest of it, so not a spoiler. You won't, you still have to read the whole thing, in other words. Okay. Uh, a little context, if this follows a long quote from a Paris Review article uh, with Robert Pinsky, in which he addresses the ambivalence of identifying oneself as a poet in today's society, which may apply to a few of us here today. If a poet laureate, who also describes himself as a non-singing vocalist, is reticent to admit to a stranger he's a poet, what does Pinsky's hesitation reveal about the duality within poets these days? As the role of poet withers in the margins of our society, resisting as it succumbs to the same specialized fragmentation as other trades and vocations, is the poet content to be exiled from the civic realm, working more exclusively in the margin of a margin solely within and toward a context of publication? as she sings less and less to a public distracted by countless new media, does her vocal confidence in singing the unsayable begin to ebb. As the poet, as artist, concedes to taking an admin desk job, does the music get filed away in the archive of anachronisms that once made us human, to be exhumed only on special occasions? The blank others draw at the word poet isn't merely social, as Pinsky suggests, but internal as well. Many esteemed poets insist the title poet can only be bestowed by others, as if calling oneself a poet is an act of egoism or hubris, as if it's up to the listener to decide whether or not you're making music with words, and if that music, supposedly timeless, is even relevant given the new context of instantaneous downloads. As if a poet is the perfect prelapsarian fool capable of naming everything but himself. When you tell a stranger you're a poet, you immediately open up a realm resonant with possibility that extends way beyond language as mere communication into music's universal realm. Once language exists only to convey information, it is dying, says Richard Hugo. Fear of deepening a conversation toward meaningful human connection by a language that sounds and feels like the thing it's talking about, admitting that we are musical, instinctive creatures, 
presents an intimidating, if not frightening, scenario for those who traffic exclusively in information. Certain songs play our whole lives without us hearing. We sing along and even dance to them, oblivious. The lyric of mine shared below finally became audible to me, walking past an all-night salon, or rather several salons, late one autumn night in Manhattan. Stylists and their clients enacting their own dance of tongues in bright mirrored light as herds of young lonely hearts headed home from nightclubs. The same music I'd hardly noticed countless times in neighborhoods from here to Central Africa, where DAP reverberates as an art form woven into the daily fabric of society. In an age when ritual and symbol are readily turned against ourselves, I now hear these notes more clearly than ever, reaching beyond identity to embrace our common longing for belonging. And I'll just read you this closing poem from that essay called Ode to My Dap. And in case you aren't familiar with Dap, suffice to say it's simply a customary greeting between two people. Soon as I get my Dap down, I'll ride uptown and find an all night salon where Yvonne will synth my Brill Cream with Afrosheen, my flat iron world with Jerry Curl. I'll wheel and burn my way to the back of Ezekiel's bus, where all of us, not just us, but all of us, wait to give our seats up to the next mother, child, or terrifier with feet. I'll get off at 125th Street, where love will come to town unabashed and beautiful, not on the back of some Ted's force-fed homily, but on opalescent hominy wings of an actual angel. Soon as I get my dap down, Aretha, Whitney, Mahalia, Marion, Beyonce, Billy rising in a clarion chorus, a riff will split wide open the moment they reveal before us life in the key of song. Soon as I get my dap down, I'll belong. I'll rewrite her history on my palm, undam the rivers, no more sitting and weeping on the banks of Babylon. I'll remove these hands from my throat Use them for their intended purpose. Get down to what matters most. Not the shade of lives, but the blood of one note. Running, spilling, blooing through them. Soon as I get my dap down, I can get my rap down. I'll come back to tell you all. I shall tell you all the crap I learned in high school. Lies I try and can't forget, still tasting the saccharine sweat of my forebears when nothing sweet came of Cain's descent. You can bet the pump will shudder and resist, gutter and ball its fist before drawing blood, not from skin, but from a deeper well. The water hole we share will help get my head around how the zoo were caged in, not only caged us apart, but labeled the cages around our hearts in Latin. Soon as I get my dab down, my litany of digits fisted and free, my hand dance, hello to me, not me, my synchronized solidarity, my brother, myself, my time out taken to get to know my body, my other, my soul, my word up, yes, but first the whole of my mother, not just her tongue. The dream I'm coming from rolled into one, Bum slap, skin snap, fly dancing light as a Jesus bug on water, fish bite duck bill cat. Soon as I get my dap down, I'll fold you into a hug. Let's shake on that. You are the music while the music lasts, says T.S. Eliot. The next time you find yourself sitting beside a stranger on the bus, 
or a park bench or an airplane. On your way home to the placeless place, both familiar and strange, where we can forget what we're supposed to be long enough to just be together. And the stranger asks, what do you do? Tell him. See what happens. A bird doesn't sing because it has an answer. It sings because it has a song. So sings Maya Angelou on her new forever postage stamp. Next time you find yourself staring at a blank page, try singing along. Thank you. Amen to that. <laughs> uh, you've been a wonderful, attentive audience, and we are at the end. But uh, I hope you've heard, even in these five-minute segments, uh, something of the breadth and depth of the of these essays and poems that are provided. And, and uh, you know, for back when I was a grad student, reading some of these craft anthologies like Donald Allen's Poetics of New American Poetry or Donald Hall's Claims for Poetry, and then much later. Maxine Cuman's lofty dogmas, and there have been so many, but I always wanted to create one too. And now, with Tamara's help, I have, and with all of your help, and, and I, without it, uh, the AWP, Associated Writing Programs Convention, a couple of weeks ago in Portland, Oregon, the book was on the table, and people on the West Coast were looking at it and saying, wow, you know, we want this. So, although we pitched this as a Vermont based uh, anthology, uh, it really has a, a national, international reach, and we hope that you'll help spread the word. So thanks all for coming, and I guess there's still food up there? There is. There's yeah, food. I think there's even drinks. the bar's still open, yeah. so, <laughs> so feel free to uh, imbibe and, and eat, and uh, maybe you can get signatures from every author here. <laughs> Just think the complete collection of 17 uh, signatures. So thanks again, and Tamara, you might have something else. That's it. Yeah. Thank you so much okay. for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.